Hey everyone, so most of you are aware of my activity exposing all the lying frauds over at Discovery Institute, most notably their shining star, James Tour, the chemist who rages against origin of life research. A while back, I made a video fairly politely debunking some claims he had been making about how clueless we are regarding the origin of life, to which he responded with a 14-part series about how dumb I am. As he quite obviously underestimated my ability to discuss this topic, I responded with a two-part series citing 50-plus papers in the field and demolishing all the lies, misrepresentations of research, and downright stupidity contained in his series. Those two videos served as essentially the only content on the internet exposing James as a complete fraud with no clue what he's talking about when it comes to this topic, and they got a lot of views. So as you can imagine, James didn't like it very much, nor did the DI as their winning horse had been demoted to an incompetent buffoon and raving lunatic overnight. It looks like it's finally time for some damage control as they recently decided to throw some money behind James and help him make some more highly stylized bullshit, desperately attempting to address my previous series and keep their science illiterate followers on the leash. As you can imagine, it's even dumber than the last one, consisting mainly of personal attacks and a regurgitation of the same lies I already debunked. So let's go through this thing and really humiliate James something awful, shall we? Here's the playlist, labeled Addressing Abiogenesis Season 2, which is actually a great name for it since it's basically a terrible sitcom on the verge of being cancelled. To give you a general sense of the flavor, it does not attempt even the fake scientific rigor of the previous series. It's basically just a parade of character assassinations, showing clips of me from unrelated videos with a band I used to be in, or smiling and drinking a lemonade, to convey the message that I'm a goofy clown that no one should take seriously, all while completely ignoring all of the science I explained in my series that proves him wrong, with only two or three exceptions which we will discuss in great detail. In fact, he outright states that he doesn't have to address anything I said because I'm just a big dumb clueless moron with no PhDs at all, and instead that he will go after my experts as though I've raised and trained them in a corral out back. So basically, one big argument from authority, which means he is proclaiming to the world that he is not interested in a genuine scientific discussion and will be preaching exclusively to his congregation of science illiterate sheep, as usual. Now, despite claiming that this series will be all about the experts, he is repeatedly taking shots at me, claiming that I don't know how to read the primary literature. In his last video, he only cited one paper, but boy, did I have a heyday with that, because he cited it so improperly. Boy, I had a great time with this. That's exactly what he did in this series. In this series, he thought, wow, I'll be really intellectual. I will just go to the internet and grab a bunch of papers and put that in there. It's going to make me look really smart. No, it didn't, because every paper he had wrong. Every paper, when you look at the data, Boy, it's just an embarrassment of riches for me to be able to talk about this thing. So this is based on a paper I referenced in my first video, and James is claiming that he had a field day with it, implying that he somehow corrected me regarding its contents. Of course, this is ridiculous because as I showed in my response, Jim's attempt to discuss this paper was comedically horrendous. To briefly reiterate, in my original video, I showed a single paper out of potential hundreds to present evidence for the development of homochirality. Again, in his response, he claimed I botched my presentation. In my response to him, I showed that the opposite is true. But because you try to figure out what is the yield here, what is the amount, how efficient is this, and you can't find it. It's nowhere in this article where you can find out the efficiency. And then here's a quote from this article, quote, less than 1% of the mixed asparagine phenylalanine crystals consisted of phenylalanine and the maximum EE of the phenylalanine was 22.3%. So in other words, less than 1% of the crystal that formed of asparagine contain phenylalanine. That's not the way it was portrayed in that article. Less than 1% of it. So you have 99% asparagine and less than 1% of the thing that you wanted crystallizing on it, phenylalanine. He says the maximum EE was 22%. What was the average EE, not the maximum EE? Because the average is the average of what you'd get. So in other words, he ran this multiple times and the highest he ever got was 22%. Was the average 2% EE? We don't know.
As you can see, he just whined about yield and enantiomeric excess, revealing that, surprise, surprise, he does not know how to read this paper, and in fact, just lies about the data. Here is a snippet of my response, and note how the values in the table contradict the numbers he gave. The variability in enantiomeric excess is irrelevant because it is kinetically driven and not thermodynamically driven. But beyond that, James does not seem to understand that all 12 amino acids resolve at once, not one at a time. Look at the table. He doesn't want to discuss any of these very large EE values, so he has to change the narrative, referring to a previous paper by the author, such that he can complain about something else. Then he is off to the races whining about yield and EE, displaying that he is unable to think like anything other than a laboratory synthetic chemist. So essentially, we have James referring to a paper I showed, claiming that I got it all wrong, neglecting to address the part in my response where I demonstrated that he got it all wrong, and then pretending that his imaginary correction somehow applies to all the dozens of papers I showed in my response that he doesn't feel like addressing. You know, like a shameless, disingenuous fraud? Let's kick things off by reviewing this example James is resting his entire reputation on and making sure he learns the science this time. I'll start with some background information so that everyone can follow along even more closely than last time. When you have a racemic amino acid in solution and you evaporate the solvent, like water in this case, you get either S and R enantiomers crystallizing separately, which is called a conglomerate, or they can crystallize together in equal proportions, which is called a racemate. With a conglomerate, the phase diagram is characterized by four zones featuring a eutectic point E, while for a racemate you have six zones and two eutectics, symmetrically distributed. This is with regards to thermodynamics. Kinetically, the situation is different. To see why, let's use the solubility curve of a solid in water as a function of temperature. Solubility increases at higher temperatures, and we get this familiar curve. On the right, we have a solution, and on the left, a suspension. But to crystallize, there must be a nucleus, and spontaneous nucleation is difficult. In the so-called metastable region, this usually happens very slowly. If you cool further and head for the labile region, nucleation occurs quickly, and the solid may crystallize completely in a matter of seconds. In the lab, the process is aided by seeding in the metastable zone. Once the first nuclei are present, crystal growth occurs and you can get a good yield of the product. If your solute is a racemic amino acid crystallizing as a conglomerate, for example racemic asparagine, you can resolve it as follows. You form a supersaturated solution by cooling or reducing the amount of solvent, reach the metastable zone, and seed with S crystals if you want the S enantiomer. The S enantiomer will crystallize quickly, whereas the R, given the large barrier to nucleation and the fact that it does not fit as well in the lattice of the S enantiomer, will crystallize much more slowly. If all goes well and you keep the system within the metastable zone until the end, you will have a 100% yield of solid S asparagine and a 100% yield of R asparagine in the supernatant. You filter and you're done. In a well-designed industrial crystallization, you will approach these values, so it's a very practical way to resolve racemates. Now, let us move to asparagine in the prebiotic world. Clearly, this tendency to produce a conglomerate is promising for delivering enantiopure material. However, in nature, you do not have accurately planned concentrations or temperatures, and probably do not have seeds. What the previous papers by the same author have demonstrated is that crystallization of racemic asparagine from water yields resolved asparagine with an enantiomeric excess, or EE, ranging between 88.9% S and 59.7% R. The results are stochastic, meaning randomly determined, because in the absence of seeding, the first nucleus forming may be S or R, and this is only due to chance. The yield is not reproducible as the conditions are not controlled, so you may have high or low yield, and over many trials, the average EE will necessarily be zero because of how probability works. That's why James whining about EE is stupid. In nature, this can occur in shallow pools with variable concentration and temperature. When material crystallizes and the pool overflows due to rain, you will have the separation of enantiomerically enriched asparagine in the solid from the supernatant containing the other enantiomer. This could be after the hundredth attempt or the thousandth, but nature had millions of years to do this, so it's only a matter of time before there will be separation of the enantiomers of asparagine. 
So again, as should be clear to everyone watching this video, when James whines about yields and EE, he demonstrates that he does not know how to read this paper because he's thinking like a laboratory chemist. He says the maximum EE was 22%. What was the average? Now, you may ask how many of the amino acids in nature crystallize this way in their most stable polymorph, and James certainly wants to know. The answer is two. So what about the other 18, which crystallize as racemates? That is what the paper is about. The authors demonstrate that if you crystallize asparagine in the presence of small amounts of up to 12 other amino acids, the mixed crystals contain all partially resolved amino acids. Check entries 5 and 6. If asparagine crystallizes as S, all the other ones are S as well, so we have a homochiral mixture. If asparagine crystallizes as R, all the others are R. James did not even understand that this was the point of the paper. Again, the process is stochastic and by definition not reproducible, which prompts a lot of scorn from James. If this were a laboratory process, it would be useless, as you can't know what you'll get each time. But that's exactly why James is clueless on topics like this. He needs for nature to do chemistry like he does in the lab in order to understand it, and that's not how nature works. The authors conclude, realistically and rather modestly, we propose that enantioselective crystallization of racemic amino acids induced by spontaneous resolution of a coexisting racemic molecule, such as DL-asparagine, contributed to the selection of L-amino acids in the biosphere. Furthermore, the resulting EE is sufficiently high to account for the predominance of L-amino acids on the Earth. Why should anyone believe Jim's assertion that the results of this paper are invalid when he so blatantly doesn't even understand what the paper is saying? This is compounded by him ignoring other mechanisms that can lead to homochirality. He does not even understand that an unequal mixture of two enantiomers crystallizing as a racemate can also be enriched by crystallization. The solid phase will be racemic, and the supernatant will have the composition of the eutectic. In some cases, amino acids have eutectics that are almost enantiomerically pure. For example, serine has a eutectic with greater than 99% EE, while histidine has 93%. So, partially resolved amino acids from the asparagine experiments can be further upgraded by a simple thermodynamically driven phenomenon. How does that sound, Mr. 700 Papers? Huh? It sounds like you have some basic chemistry to relearn since you just got schooled by someone with zero publications. As I've said before, this is probably an example where James is not lying and just genuinely does not understand this kind of chemistry. This is only one of the hundreds of papers dealing with amino acid spontaneous resolution, so I do not want to claim that this is the peak of origin of life research. But James can't debunk this, so he has to shamefully pretend I did not understand the paper, and he does so in his latest series by just repeating over and over again that I got it wrong, when in fact, as I just showed for a second time in even greater detail, James has no clue what he's talking about. I had to do this in such great detail to prove precisely this point. When James references this paper and then claims that my imaginary cluelessness is true for all the other papers in my previous response, he is flat out admitting that he can't get any of those papers right either. I will make this abundantly clear as we continue through this series. James is an emperor with no clothes, demanding praise from his science illiterate peasantry while real scientists just laugh and ignore him. Anyway, with the core dishonesty exposed, let's get through this series and try to find some science. There isn't much, to be honest, but the first point he tries to make is just a big fat lie as usual. It's about the so-called primordial soup model, which no one really says anymore, but when we do say it, it just means a bunch of biologically relevant molecules in water. That's all. Soup is just a colorful word meaning molecules in water that over many millions of years led to the development of life. Let's see how James horrendously mischaracterizes this model when he's preaching to his congregation. You think you've been taught things that aren't quite right? This whole thing about molecules in a puddle or in a pond, lightning strikes, molecules form. Those molecules form into slithering creatures and they come out of this pond. 
That's the primordial soup model. That's a bunch of nonsense. It's not only the standard model to high school students, it's the standard model to college students, it's the standard model to graduate students. It's in all of their textbooks. I've explained multiple times how his mischaracterization of the primordial soup as some goo getting hit by lightning and a creature slithering out is totally idiotic and at absolute best an unbelievably oversimplified version taught to middle school students. Now let's see how he tees up this topic in the new series. Let's start looking at the primordial soup. This is something where Dave says that this, the primordial soup model is only taught to eighth graders, not in any advanced textbook. Nope. Already starting with the straw man, eh, James? I said that the way you describe it is only taught to middle schoolers, because they're not ready to learn complicated science. In college textbooks, there's real science, like the kind I try to teach you about. But James insists that the lightning bolt straight to the slithering creatures is all you can find in college textbooks across the nation. And he has proof. Here's a list compiled by Casey Luskin, one of the other Discovery Institute frauds that I debunked to smithereens in another video, played at high speed with cute elevator music, which does not actually show the contents of any of the textbooks. Here's all of them that are mentioning the primordial soup or the hot smelly soup model. All of them mention it. So basically, he is pretending that all of these college-level textbooks show the goo and the lightning lizard he is whining about, and nothing else, because trust me, bro. So what do the textbooks really show? Luckily, I have a number of college-level textbooks in this area, since I sometimes refer to them to generate my college-level science tutorials. Let's take a peek. Here's the ever-popular Biology by Campbell. Let's head to the section on the history of life on Earth. We've got some stuff on amino acid synthesis, macromolecule synthesis, assembly of RNA by polymerization of nucleotides on Montmorillonite clay, self-replicating RNA, also known as ribozymes, protocell assembly, Hmm, I'm not seeing anything about lightning and slithering creatures here, James. It looks like a simplified version of all the science I've been trying to explain to you fit for a college freshman embarking on their journey of higher learning. How about Molecular Biology of the Cell by Alberts et al. In Chapter 6, there is a whole section on the RNA world and origins of life. Included are concepts like autocatalysis and self-replication, the potential elaborate structures and functions RNA can adopt, natural selection in sets of molecules capable of self-replication, information flows, spontaneous bilayer formation to produce prebiotic membranes in vesicles that evolved into protocells. Lots of prebiotic chemistry with references, evolution of proteins, DNA, metabolic pathways, organelles, multicellular organisms, and so on. Does that sound like a lizard crawling out of electrified goo to you, James? All the books I've ever seen are like this. All of them. James is lying. He is lying about what primordial soup means and then looking for books that mention the phrase primordial soup and pretending that they say what he says, which they don't. Anyone could easily verify that he is lying by opening up any college textbook, but his congregation does not do this because they've never seen a college biology textbook and they believe him blindly. After all, he's on a mission from God. What do you have to say for yourself, James? I'm a sinner. Now let's get to the meat of it. The first three videos are focused on complaining about Lee Cronin. He's especially mad at Lee because Lee used a word to describe James quite accurately. So I think there's something rather nefarious in his statements. I don't think it's because he's being stupid. I think it's because he's being selective and he is misquoting information so that people can go into literature and see something and then make a connection without fully understanding it. Nefarious. I'm rather nefarious in what I'm doing because I'm going against the, the consensus here. What does nefarious mean? Well, it's typically an action or activity, wicked or criminal. Okay, so what I'm doing is either wicked or criminal. 
James acts like Lee just used a racial slur or something. This kind of pearl clutching is quite typical in his community, and it's a diversion tactic. But more on that later. To start, we go back to Jim's favorite clip where Lee is explaining a biogenesis on a radio show in very simple terms for non-scientists. And James keeps interrupting to scream, show me the chemistry, or adds mocking cartoons to pretend that Lee is saying nothing. Sorry, James, did you want him to formally present his research as though he were making a conference presentation to his colleagues when he is just speaking to lay people? Because that would be a very dumb thing to expect him to do. But then again, you can't tell the difference between primary literature and content for lay people, can you? We've already demonstrated that by exposing your lies about Jack Shostak and the Nature article that really wasn't one. Now, didn't we? He says that that, that, uh, uh, this is current scientific consensus. You got it right on that, Lee. That's current scientific consensus, which I don't go for. And you want everybody to start following you like you're the Pied Piper? Well, isn't this adorable? When something is consensus, it is agreed upon by the majority of the researchers in a field. So by saying consensus and then pretending it's just Lee with a Q outfit on, you sound like a fraud. Also, you don't sound smart by arrogantly proclaiming that literally everyone in this field is wrong and you're right, while demonstrating consistently that you don't understand the field. Origin of Life research, which entails hundreds of people and thousands of papers and dozens of specialized conferences, isn't wrong just because you want it to be, and your attempts at discrediting these many researchers are pathetic. Let's continue. You didn't explain. He gave you the chance to explain. You didn't do it on Briar Lee's program. He gave you the chance to explain yourself here. You didn't do it here. It's how we're creating experiments to create life. Okay. You're flipping coins. You got royal flushes. Tell me the chemistry. You're a chemist. Tell us the chemistry. How does this happen? No royal flushes. Just bring me through the chemistry here. James, he can't explain complicated research on a radio program for lay people. And he did indeed explain lots of science in my content. You just don't want to learn anything. Then you have the balls to play a clip of Lee doing a great job explaining a relevant concept for a general audience. And you just show the zero counter and a bunny running around as if the bunny somehow negates the explanation he's giving. So if every droplet is different, suddenly you have individuals. If individuals are now interacting in those droplets all bashing around in that salad dressing, they can compete with each other, they can cooperate together, and they can start to record. He's explaining systems chemistry, James, that field you pretend doesn't exist. Sets of molecules enclosed in vesicles competing for resources, spontaneously dividing and optimizing by natural selection. That's the chemistry you are asking for. If you care more about bunnies than learning science, go be a bunny farmer. This stunt isn't fooling anyone but the brainwashed losers who can't process a single thing that hits their ears and need cartoons to tell them what's happening. But to address the main gripe, it's Jim's favorite lie, that we are totally clueless about abiogenesis. In the fossil record, that life appeared very, very quickly, okay, after the late heavy bombardment. So that is evidence in the fossil record that is not disputable. I think we both agree, planet Earth formed, Rocks, simple chemistry, no life, right? We don't know all the details of that, but then within a few hundred million years, there's evidence in the fossil record that life formed simple cellular life. Those two facts are not, as far as I know, disputed by the science. Those those are not contestable. How we got from the point A to point B? Absolutely, but I didn't say, I did not say (laughs) we knew. So so we're agreeing, so you and I agree, Lee, that how we got from the simple molecules to life, it happened, but we don't know how. This is James in typical fashion, trying to pretend that us not knowing every last detail about how it happened is equivalent to we are clueless. And this deliberate misrepresentation is why Lee was getting pretty annoyed in this exchange. But James plays it over and over again anyway, knowing that his idiot followers have no idea what's going on. 
Remember in my previous series where I explained how dumb this is? That if there are a bunch of ways that he could have gotten to my house, even if I don't know which way he took, it doesn't mean he didn't make the trip? I guess he didn't like that analogy because he just keeps spewing the same garbage. Let's try another version with a little more science in it. If we have a complex chemical reaction and scientists are arguing about the mechanism, proposing three different theories based on experimental data, an onlooker will correctly deduce that we do not yet know the mechanism, which means more conclusive data are needed. But they would not conclude that we are clueless, because all three mechanisms are based on reasonable observations, and one of those three is almost certainly the answer. We simply need to figure out which is the correct one. It does not mean that the chemistry can only happen when God snaps his fingers and does magic. But this is what James clearly implies about abiogenesis. If he can find flaws in any of the steps people have proposed, he will have made his God of the Gaps more plausible. This is why he's constantly whining about prebiotic conditions, because whenever there is science he doesn't like, he can point to one detail that is not the focus of the study at all, say it's not sufficiently prebiotic even though they weren't trying to make it so, and wave away any profound conclusion reached or phenomenon being elusive by that research, totally oblivious to the fact that good research involves minimizing variables. Scientists are testing one thing and seeing what happens. It's quite hilarious that I have to explain this to a scientist, but here we are. Incredibly, the entire first half-hour-long video contains zero actual science, so let's jump to the second one, where we finally get to some actual research, and this features what James dishonestly presents as some sort of win for him, the foremost reaction, something I talked about in my response when discussing the prebiotic synthesis of sugars. And finally, going back to individual nucleotides, there is the tidbit where I called James out for his weak argument regarding Cannizzaro reactions. He thinks that because sugars undergo these reactions in competition with the foremost reaction, prebiotic synthesis of sugars will be a total mess. Well, it's a really weak point, because again, Cannizzaro reactions would not lead to the type of molecules which are known to self-replicate, and thus would not be selected for by molecular evolution. Yes, that pesky concept of selection that James pretends doesn't exist. But furthermore, because I correctly pointed out that such strongly basic conditions are not a given, he had to reference the original paper from 1861 that invokes catalysis by calcium hydroxide, as well as a Wikipedia entry which says that in mineral form it's rare but can be found in some rocks, in order to pretend that strong base is indeed a given and inescapable. So, James is playing this bit because I humiliated him with dozens of papers regarding prebiotic synthesis of all the biomolecules, and without being able to respond to any of it, he needs to pretend for his viewers that he doesn't need to, because apparently I can't read them. This is relatively easy to do because his followers have no clue what he's talking about, and they didn't watch my content. That's why he plays a clip over and over where I'm modestly describing my abilities since I acknowledge that I'm not an expert, even though I can indeed get through these papers, whereas James pretends to be an expert while consistently demonstrating how clueless he is. Therefore, all he needs is some kind of perceived gotcha moment, and they will pretend he is the champion. Then, in Dave's same video, he starts talking about the foremost reaction, and he shows a reference. He should have read that reference. An enormous amount of work has been done in this area since the 90s. So in examining real-world examples of autocatalysis, it would be much more impressive to fast-forward to present day. Below, I will link this 2021 review of autocatalysis, which neatly summarizes the breadth of application this concept presents, only part of which is the origin of life. It covers essential background information regarding kinetics that James might want to study, as well as dozens of examples of autocatalysis in a variety of contexts, including the strictly organic and feasibly prebiotic, such as the foremost reaction he so frequently brings up. Oh, there it is, the foremost reaction which I bring up. That's his slide. In his paper, which he cites, calcium hydroxide, which he feels is irrelevant because that wouldn't be available, but then he even shows a slide that says calcium hydroxide. Dave, didn't you even read your own paper that you're putting up there? You put it up there. It's right there, calcium hydroxide. 
James, this is a review, meaning it's just a list of examples of autocatalytic reactions, which I suggested to you because you could not even properly define autocatalysis. Of course there is the foremost reaction, as originally presented by Butlerow. It's a classic early example of autocatalysis, a catalytic cycle to be precise, and he used calcium hydroxide, which almost certainly has nothing to do with origin of life. It's just a base he had available. You're shameless twisting context to sound diligent. Now let's add another layer. So Dave shows this article, Taming the Combinatorial Explosion of the Foremost Reaction, and this is by Lee Cronin. And so Lee starts talking about this. This is just from, from Dave's video. And Dave, you're gonna have to read this. Right there is the foremost reaction, and what does he got? He used calcium hydroxide. Your own expert used calcium hydroxide in the foremost reaction. There it is expanded. Calcium hydroxide right there. So, you know, you, you say in one, in one hand it's irrelevant, and then in the other hand you bring it up from another reference, and then on your third hand you, what you do is you go and you bring in an expert who uses this and you didn't even notice it. You didn't even notice it. You just put it in there. And uh, I'm telling you, the guy doesn't know chemistry. Dave Farina doesn't know chemistry. The level of stupidity here is astounding. James is pretending that this reaction can only happen with calcium hydroxide, which is wrong, points to Lee's study, which uses calcium hydroxide, which doesn't have anything to do with the research question of the paper at all, and then pretends I'm a moron who can't read papers. It's really dishonest and pathetic. Let's get a little more context so that everyone can be perfectly clear about how stupid and desperate this tactic is, all while teaching James some more science, shall we? So, many origin-of-life researchers think the foremost reaction may have played a role in abiogenesis, although the results are often complex mixtures, and I showed the classical scheme based on the Butlero conditions in my previous response. In this reaction, which had nothing to do with origin of life, just a guy doing chemistry, he condensed formaldehyde in the presence of calcium hydroxide and obtained complex mixtures of sugars. Over the years, people have investigated this reaction extensively and have found that it can be catalyzed not only by the strongly basic calcium hydroxide, but also by milder bases, including organic ones. Just to cite from a recent review, one can use any of these ionic solids, weakly basic catalysts like zeolites, carbonate apatite, a mixture of kaolin with AlCl3, thiazolium salts, triethanolamine, 2-dimethylaminoethanol, pyridine, 1-methylpiperidine, picolines, collidine, 4-methylmorpholine, and more. References to these studies are linked below. So, to reiterate, you absolutely don't need calcium hydroxide to do this chemistry. On board so far, buddy? Now, James made the point that under the strongly basic conditions with calcium hydroxide, the Canizaro reaction would compete. In my response, I clearly explained that calcium hydroxide is unlikely to have been the catalyst for the foremost reaction under prebiotic conditions. Furthermore, the Canizaro reaction converts two molecules of formaldehyde into methanol and a formate salt. It is not catalyzed by base, but rather it consumes one equivalent of base, and therefore requires excess base, meaning it requires extremely basic conditions. Like laboratory conditions, not necessarily what you find in nature. Right, James? So in my response, I said that first of all, even if formed, these side products would lower the yield, but not interfere in the production of ribose. And second, that calcium hydroxide was probably not involved anyway. He even played all of this in his latest video and didn't bother responding because he knows his viewers have no clue what's happening. So then, once again, he proceeds to flash a scheme from Lee's paper where he also uses calcium hydroxide as if his goal had been to demonstrate the role of this base in the prebiotic foremost reaction, thus demonstrating that James is totally incapable of understanding this research, or only interested in misrepresenting it. The goal of the paper was to show the effect of reaction cycling on mineral surfaces 
on the selectivity of the reaction. The classic Butlero conditions were just the reference reaction. Addition of certain mineral surfaces and product cycling showed differential selectivity in the product distribution. That's the point of the paper, not analyzing anything about what base to use. Pretty easy to understand, right? But once again, James claims I haven't read the paper, simply because the chosen base was calcium hydroxide. Again, we do not know which prebiotic basis led to sugars from formaldehyde, but we know the catalyst does not even need to be strongly basic, and also that base is not used up in this reaction, unlike the Canizaro reaction. That Lee used calcium hydroxide is totally irrelevant. Quoting from the paper, the overall number of products detected reduces as the number of cycles increases as a result of recursively enhanced mineral environment selectivity, thus limiting the combinatorial explosion. This discovery demonstrates how the involvement of mineral surfaces with simple reactions could lead to the emergence of some building blocks found in RNA, ribose and uracil, under much simpler conditions than originally thought. So what is Lee saying? Does this have anything to do with testing bases or their prebiotic relevance? No. The bottom line is that even under generally basic conditions, sugars and nucleobases do form, despite the Canizaro reaction, and more selectively by product cycling on mineral surfaces. That's why James has to deflect. That's why he has to pull an idiotic stunt like this, just shouting calcium hydroxide repeatedly as though it means anything at all. Because no matter how much he pretends Lee's research is nonsense, it isn't. It's just that it debunks Jim's script of lies, and there's nothing he can do about it, apart from his typical tactics of shifting the goalposts to talk about stereochemistry, or something else that involves a totally separate research question. Look at this. There is a ribose, but it's not really ribose because you don't have the stereochemistry. So he's not showing any stereochemistry here. It's funny, the referees who peer-reviewed this paper found it worthy of publication. Too bad they didn't send it to you, huh, James? So let's quickly review since that was a lot of information, and unlike James, I'm genuinely trying to teach and not just confuse people with jargon until they blindly agree with me. James pretends calcium hydroxide is needed for the foremost reaction. It isn't. I just proved it isn't. It's just a good base to use when you want to do this chemistry, as was done in Butlero's original study, which had nothing to do with origin of life. Then James pretends that researchers using calcium hydroxide to do this reaction somehow proves that's how they think it happened prebiotically. It doesn't, and they don't. Strongly basic conditions almost certainly weren't available, and nature used something else, like one of the prebiotically plausible reagents I just showed, or catalytic mineral surfaces like magnesium iron silicates on olivine. Scientists do science on one thing at a time, and don't need to overcomplicate things with exotic reagents when it has nothing to do with the research question. They just need some base that works, and everyone knows this one works. This entire section ranting about calcium hydroxide is one big turd sandwich that serves only one purpose, to trick his viewers into thinking I don't know how to read papers, which will only work if he chooses some tiny detail that he can point to with arrows and misrepresent the context, and then play an idiotic meme of dudes cheering right at the part where he wants them to think he's somehow winning something. This is the single most idiotic and blatantly manipulative stunt James pulled in this entire series. What do you have to say for yourself, James? I'm a sinner. To continue, I also referenced a paper by Breslow, another high-caliber chemist, which he flashed without discussing. He literally just does his calcium hydroxide stunt and then doesn't acknowledge any of the actual research because it is profoundly detrimental to his script of lies. In this paper, Breslow shows amino acids promoting the foremost reaction, even with stereochemical induction. Breslow suggests a connection between D-stereochemistry in sugars and L in amino acids. Reading yet again from the conclusion, since James seems to have missed it the first time, However, the finding that the defining chiral center in D-sugars can be formed using L-amino acids as catalysts 
under really simple, credible prebiotic conditions does simplify the requirements for all proposals. It shows that the origin of the D sugars in life today is not a mystery if indeed the small excesses of L-alpha-methyl amino acids were the seeds from space that started the preference for the L-isomers in normal amino acids. The L-amino acids would then cause the preference for D sugars. It's a modest suggestion corroborated by experiment. As you can see, no hype. Why did you flash this paper but not address it, James? Inconvenient to your cause? Desperately projecting the facade of diligence? Or were you just terrified of the astrochemical implications that you know you are totally clueless about and incapable of discussing? So as expected, it's already abundantly clear that this series is just more of James misrepresenting papers, misrepresenting what I said, ignoring any research inconvenient to his faith, and lying through his teeth to try and make me look stupid to his brainwashed viewers, which he achieves through mere arrows and memes. James, aren't you ashamed of being such a manipulative liar? Doesn't your God hate liars? I'm a sinner. You sure are, buddy. Anyway, we're just getting started, but we've already exposed quite a few whoppers out of Jim's mouth and some incompetence to boot. But it's going to get a lot worse. I'll see you in part two.